Caffeine is the world's favourite performance enhancing drug, but most people use it incorrectly and aren't maximising the benefits on muscle performance, cognition, heart health and four other benefits. Plus, there are safety concerns, there's a group that shouldn't use caffeine, and an extremely common mistake that most people use when consuming caffeine. There's a lot to get through in this video. In their natural forms, coffee and tea contain several chemical components that are associated with their effects, including caffeine and antioxidants. In the United States, the average coffee consumption is two coffees per day, and that's roughly 280 milligrams of caffeine. So each cup of coffee has got about 140 milligrams of caffeine, whereas tea has got 26. Before addressing the first common mistake that people often make when consuming caffeine, let's have a look at the exercise performance benefits. This is crucial to consider for our overall health, because we know that higher muscle strength is associated with lower, all-cause death rates. So how can caffeine improve our exercise performance? Well, from multiple studies, we can see that it improves exercise capacity during prolonged exercise, so greater than 90 minutes, as well as high intensity training between 20 and 60 minutes, and even short duration high intensity exercise from about one to five minutes. It also seems to improve movement velocity in both the upper and lower body. And that's according to a meta-analysis that combined 12 separate randomized controlled trials together. So given that caffeine seems to improve both peak and average velocity, it suggests that caffeine is beneficial for weightlifting, throwing and jumping sports, as well as other activities that rely on powerful movements. There's also great research showing that caffeine it improves reaction times, delays fatigue and it improves performance in tennis. And from the research that we've got today, it appears that the optimum caffeine amount is about 200 milligrams or one and a half cups of coffee per day. There are several possible mechanisms for how caffeine offers these benefits. It stimulates our central nervous system, muscles and other organs such as our heart and it does this by binding to adenosine receptors, thereby blocking the activity of adenosine. Adenosine has sedative-like properties, so by blocking it, caffeine increases vigour and reduces fatigue. It also appears to reduce perceived pain and exertion. And during the early stages of endurance exercise, caffeine might help to mobilize free fatty acids as a source of energy. Now that we've gone through some of the proposed mechanisms for how caffeine works, we can go through the first point about taking caffeine correctly. You'll see online some health influencers encouraging you to wait 90 minutes after waking up before taking caffeine. The theory goes that when you wake up, your adenosine levels, which again have sedative effects, are at their lowest point, so caffeine won't have much, if any, benefit because there's hardly any adenosine to block. But if you wait 90 minutes, your adenosine levels start to rise and now the caffeine can block that adenosine and have an effect. Plus, by waiting 90 minutes, you make sure that the caffeine doesn't get in the way of other hormone rhythms, such as the natural rise of cortisol in the morning. Now, that's a nice sounding theory, but I couldn't find any randomized controlled trials that specifically explored that idea, so in my opinion, there's no hard and fast rule. Personally, I love my morning coffee, but I use it as a reward. So my day starts at 5am, I get up, I do a set of push-ups, pull-ups and ab exercises, then smash out an hour of work, and only once I've done that will I make myself a coffee, and I'll drink it before I get the kids up at 7am. That's what works for me, but equally if you wanted to have your coffee first thing in the morning, there's no randomized controlled trials showing that that's a bad idea. Instead, there's something far more important about correctly taking caffeine, which we'll cover later in the video, but for now, let's have a look at the brain benefits. I want to start with a caveat. Most of the research that we've got on caffeine and our health is from observational research, as in simply observing a population, getting them to fill out a questionnaire, and seeing what insights we can glean from that information. But such studies make it difficult to identify caffeine itself as the causal agent and to exclude any other confounding factors. For example, healthy people are more likely to consume caffeine compared to unhealthy people. But with that caveat out the way, there's still a lot we can learn from the current research we have today. As we've already gone through, caffeine is a potent antagonist of central and peripheral nervous system adenosine receptors, thereby stimulating the release of excitatory neurotransmitters. And while that improves vigilance and reaction time, there's some really interesting other effects it has, starting with Parkinson's disease. We've got a massive meta-analysis that combined all of the relevant clinical studies together, which concluded that caffeine is associated with a lower risk of developing Parkinson's disease in healthy individuals, and it seems to slow down the progression of symptoms in patients that already have Parkinson's disease. 
We don't yet know the exact mechanism for how caffeine can offer these benefits, but it's a really interesting finding. It's a similar story for Alzheimer's disease. A 2023 meta-analysis demonstrated that consuming two and a half cups of coffee per day minimizes the risk of Alzheimer's disease, and one cup of tea per day leads to an 11% reduction in cognitive deficits. And those human studies are backed up by mice studies, where mice who were supplemented with caffeine also had lower rates of Alzheimer's disease. Furthermore, the clinical guidelines make a mention that coffee and tea consumption have been associated with a lower risk of strokes. There are multiple studies showing this, but let's just focus on the most recent one which was published in 2021. It took information from the UK Biobank involving over 365,000 participants. During an average follow-up of 11.4 years, they found that compared with people who didn't drink tea or coffee, drinking two or three cups of tea or coffee a day was associated with a 32% lower risk of strokes and a 28% lower risk of dementia. What the authors found is a U-shaped association, so I do want to exercise caution here. A lot of the time when we look at observational research, we can find these U-shaped association curves. But as we went through earlier, we cannot fully rely on this observational research. Next is depression. A 2016 meta-analysis showed that compared with the lowest level of consumption, people that consumed caffeine had an almost 28% reduction in depression rates. Based on the research so far, there appear to be significant benefits for exercise performance and brain health. We're going to go through a few more effects and then discuss how to maximize the benefits from caffeine and minimize the harms. When it comes to heart health, this is often an area where people are concerned about the risks of caffeine. Because caffeine is a stimulant, initially it causes our blood vessels to constrict, raising our blood pressure. Surprisingly though, a 2018 meta-analysis showed that people who consume coffee have a lower risk of high blood pressure. So here's what's likely going on. When we initially drink tea or coffee, yes it does constrict our blood vessels and initially raises our blood pressure. However, coffee and tea also has a diuretic effect. It makes us pee and it seems that that diuretic effect more than compensates for that initial blood vessel constriction. One of the other big safety concerns is arrhythmias. Again, because caffeine is a stimulant, it's thought that caffeine may result in our hearts going into dangerous rhythms. However, in a meta-analysis of seven observational studies involving over 100,000 individuals, caffeine exposure was not associated with a risk of atrial fibrillation. This lack of association was confirmed in a second meta-analysis and a large population-based Danish cohort study. So I do want to put that safety concern to rest. Caffeine consumption, it doesn't seem to increase the chances of developing atrial fibrillation. However, there are a couple of other arrhythmias that may happen. And the guidelines suggest that patients susceptible to cardiac arrhythmias should avoid consuming large quantities of caffeine, although modest amounts appear to be safe. Nevertheless, there are patients who may be more sensitive to caffeine and note a relationship of palpitations to their caffeine intake. So if you're one of those people, maybe you should avoid caffeine. The next concern is cholesterol, but this one is a bit nuanced. We've got research of over 132,000 adults showing no association between the intake of filtered, and that's the key point here, filtered coffee and total cholesterol. However, for unfiltered coffee, that's where we do see increases in cholesterol levels, including LDL cholesterol, not what we want. So my advice is to avoid unfiltered coffee. But if we zoom out and have a look at the overall rates of heart attacks, there was a massive 2014 meta-analysis involving over 1 million participants. And once again, this study found a U-shaped association, where compared to drinking no caffeine, the rates of heart disease went down, with the lowest rate at 3.5 cups per day, leading the authors to conclude that moderate coffee consumption was associated with lower cardiovascular disease rates. And moving to the four other benefits that caffeine offers, again if we zoom out, we can see that most studies link coffee consumption and lower all-cause death rates. When we examined the latest trial in 2017, it involved over half a million men and women over a follow-up period of 16.4 years. Compared to people who didn't drink tea or coffee, there was a reduction in all-cause death rates by about 12%. There are three other benefits to mention, and then we'll go through the common mistake people make when consuming caffeine. So number two on the list is cancer. 
Coffee intake has been associated with a lower risk of certain cancers, including endometrial and liver cancer. The World Cancer Research Fund conducted a meta-analysis and it found a 7% lower risk in endometrial cancer and a 14% lower risk of liver cancer. The mechanisms for this potential anti-cancer effect is unknown. Number three on the list is diabetes and insulin resistance. The clinical guidelines make a note that long-term coffee consumption may be associated with a decreased risk of type 2 diabetes. That point is based from research such as this 2017 British Medical Journal paper showing that coffee consumption was consistently associated with a lower risk of type 2 diabetes by about 30%. And the final benefit I want to go through is fatty liver. The risk of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in patients who drank coffee was significantly lower compared to patients that didn't by about 30%. This 2017 meta-analysis also found a significant decrease in liver fibrosis for people who drank coffee compared to those who didn't. So you can see that there appears to be significant benefits from consuming caffeine. Finally, an addiction that's great for us. Now let's go through how to use it correctly. As I mentioned earlier, you can wait for 90 minutes after waking up to have your first cup of tea or coffee like I do, but the evidence behind this theory is weak. Make sure that the coffee is filtered, and I'm sure I don't have to tell you this, but I'm going to mention it anyway. Please don't add sugar, cream, or butter to your tea or coffee. But here's the big mistake that most people make. Caffeine has got a really long half-life of about 5 hours, so it lasts in your body for a really long time. After 5 hours you still have 50% of the caffeine, after 10 hours you've got 25%, and after 15 hours you've got 12.5%. That's a problem because since caffeine is a stimulant and it blocks adenosine, it can interfere with our sleep. And while some people will say that it doesn't affect their sleep, that they can still have a coffee late in the night and still fall asleep, it does affect your quality of sleep, so you're likely going to wake up not as rested as what you could be. As I outline in my roadmap to looking young and feeling strong, link in the pinned comment, ideally you want to have no caffeine past 9.30 in the morning. You want your caffeine levels to be as low as possible when you're ready to fall asleep and maximize the quality of your sleep. Personally, I don't think people should be consuming more than two to three cups of coffee per day. That level likely locks in the benefits and minimizes the harms, and this extends to pre-workout. So a lot of pre-workout mixtures, they contain caffeine, so don't have a pre-workout that's got more than 200 milligrams of caffeine, and make sure to consume it before 9.30 a.m. As for people who should completely avoid caffeine, if you're trying to become pregnant or you are pregnant, the general advice is to avoid it altogether. And on the point of sleep, if you're looking to maximize your sleep quality, make sure to check out this next video here on melatonin. And if you want early access to these videos, as well as access to the Discord server, make sure to check out the pinned comment where you can find a link to my Patreon.